This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Many of Tim's family had served in World War I and World War II, and from a young age he was determined to follow their path. Overcoming huge competition for places, he becomes a driver of the Leopard AS-1 main battle tank at the 1st Armoured Regiment of the Australian Army. Australia is largely ignored by most Cold War histories, however we hear how the Australian Army prepared to fight the Musaurians, a thinly disguised notional enemy which was obviously the Soviets or one of their satellites in everything but name. I'm delighted to welcome Tim to our Cold War conversation. I was born in uh, 1969 in a little country town called Yarram in the state of Victoria, down in the southeastern corner of, of Australia. Um, an idyllic upbringing, really. Um, little bush community, um, you know, great parents. You know, I, I don't have one of those raised in a, in a family of violence stories or anything like that that often come out of the Cold War and, and defence service. You know, I was taught to shoot and hunt and move through the bush by my uh, my dad and my grandfather. Went to, went to school, enjoyed school. Just a lovely rural upbringing, really. And... Um, you know, went to uh, went to the Boy Scouts, joined the Boy Scouts, and and met a met a fellow there. He was my scout leader, and and he was in the uh, the Army Reserve um, in in, in um, the local regiment called the Prince of Wales's Light Horse. And yeah, you know, every so often he'd turn up in his uniform, and you know there was this mystique about him, and uh, at least to me, and. Also, in that little rural community, we held our Anzacs, you know, as, as heroes. And on Anzac Day, the 25th of April each year, you know, I used to see them march in the parade and these old old fellows with straight backs and, and medals on their chest. And, and I thought, you know, I want to be one of those guys one day. So, yeah, that's basically my upbringing, just, just this classic Australian r- rural childhood. It was beautiful, really. And was there a history of serving in the military in your family? Uh, yeah, First and Second World War, like um, my great-grandfather, he was an infantryman on the Somme, etc. You know, on, on my grandmother's side, there was four brothers, four of her uncles went off to war and uh, three of them were killed in France. There was, you know, there was other cousins that had served in Gallipoli, etc. Um, in the Second World War, my pa's, um, uncles and cousins had all fought against the, you know, the Germans and Japanese in the Second World War as well. So, my my mother's uncles were um, were commandos against the Japanese up in in Borneo in the Second World War. So, yeah, I guess there's, there's a pretty significant history of service in my family. My my father didn't go to Vietnam. He said he was he was willing to to uh, go if he was called, but he wasn't called, and so um, you know that never happened. So I guess it skipped that generation, but I certainly wanted to get into into service. Well, that, that's certainly a very rich military uh, heritage you've just, just described there. And I think a lot of people forget that uh, Australia was involved in, in Vietnam. Uh, many people see it as solely a, uh, a US-led war. But uh, we'll, we'll come on to uh, Vietnam in, in a little while. So... With this uh, scout leader, he's quite a big influence for you. It, it sounds like. What what steps did you take to uh, join the military? Yeah, yeah, he was a he was a great mentor to me, and um, I kind of wanted to emulate him, I guess. And and um, so you could join the uh, the army reserve or or the regular army in Australia at the time from seventeen, as long as you had your parents' permission. And I thought. To myself, I might get a head start on that, and so I turned up at about sixteen and a half at the local army reserve depot, and thought oh, it'll take him a while to work out that I'm underaged. And anyway, it didn't take him long at all to work out that I was underaged. And they said, "Go away, <laughs> come back when you're seventeen with with the form signed." And so I swore the oath to Her Majesty on on my seventeenth birthday. Um, I, you know, I'd badgered my parents for years, and and uh, had the forms all filled out, everything ready to go. So, I think on the on the day of my seventeenth birthday, I was I turned up at the Army Reserve Depot, and uh, 
they were happy to swear me in. And that's when it all started. That was uh, June 1986. So. What was your role um, within that, that res- reserve regiment? The Prince Wales Light Horse um, at the time was a medium reconnaissance regiment in the Armoured Corps. They were fielding M113 A1s, uh, the you know the American APC, which we'd bought in 1965. We bought them new off the Americans and used them right through Vietnam, and and yeah, they've sold. You know, they're they're still serving those those wagons in upgraded form. But yeah, so they were using those as a as a light reconnaissance vehicle. Um, in every troop as well, there was there was two of those, but they were fitted with the British Scorpion 76 millimeter turrets, and they were called medium reconnaissance vehicles, and. So they were an Australian hybrid of the American M113 and the British Scorpion CVRT. So they were a very interesting thing. Um, and also in each troop, the Delta vehicle um, was an armoured personnel carrier. It carried a uh, recon scout section, as we would call it now. Back then we called ourselves assault troopers. So they were like armoured infantry, but specialising in reconnaissance, dismounted reconnaissance and security of that armoured group when it went firm at night. So I, I started out as an assault trooper, uh, which was a, an incredible course. Um, lots of dismounted infantry work, you know, surveillance, um, shooting every weapon in the Australian, you know, armoured corps inventory. So uh, the the thirty calibre Browning machine gun, the fifty calibre Browning machine gun, the M72 66 millimeter um, Schrosch, uh, short range anti armor weapon, the 84 millimeter Carl Gustav or Charlie Gutsake, as we used to call it, uh, the Wombat gun, the M79 um, 40 millimeter grenade launcher, um, M60 um, general purpose machine gun, the um, L2A1 heavy barreled version of the SLR rifle as well as the SLR and the the hated F1 submachine gun, which was an Australian submachine gun, um, nine millimetre, a bit like the the Sterling submachine gun that was in British service. But, you know, just no one liked the, the, the nine mil. Um, so, yeah, we shot all those, um, did radio work, you know, and, and I deployed on a couple of exercises um, with, with that unit while I was still a reservist. Uh, and also trained as a M113A1 driver. So I was, I was pretty busy. You know, I'd finished high school at that time and had nothing else to do. So I just put my hand up for every course that I could. And so I, my introduction into the Army Reserve, you know, it's supposed to be every Tuesday and the occasional weekend and you know, the occasional two-week exercise. But it, for me, it was pretty intense. I was there all the time and on courses. So loved it. Just loved it. Loved being in the uniform. Loved deploying to the field. I, I feel like I was a field soldier more than a parade ground soldier, and and um, um, really got a taste for the army. And I, there were a couple of old Vietnam veterans um, as what we called Carter staff. They were regular army um, fellows that you know coordinated the training for the reservists, etc. And both of those guys, um, Kev Hunter and Terry Thistlewaite, Took me under their under their wing, and you know they they knew I wanted to go into the regular army, and they certainly uh, encouraged me and facilitated me um, in doing that. So about eighteen months after I joined the reserve, I signed up for the regular army. Before we get to the the regular army, I'm just interested to know. I mean, Australia is a long way away from Europe, and sort of like the the hot borders of the cold war who was going to be your enemy who were you training to fight against um at the time in in the 80s we were in that post vietnam cringe you know we during the vietnam period obviously there was no doubt who we were going to fight it was it was the communists through south southeast asia and um, because you know our guys were actually doing that and there was still a bit of a lingering um, suspicion that you know any real threat to our country would have would have come through the archipelago to our north communist influence I guess but we had a notional training enemy and that was that was called they called it the Missourian Armed Forces and it, I look back on it now and I, I chuckle away the Missourian Armed Forces 
kind of had Soviet equipment, Soviet doctrine. They looked like Soviets. Uh, they they had a few funny little Southeast Asian aspects to them, but yeah, you know, generally they were the Soviets. And and it was, you know, the Australian Army was has always been an expeditionary army, and so you know there was always the assumption that we would end up either fighting in Australia for Australia or uh, being exported somewhere else to, you know, to fight for Australia's national interests. So, you know, although we're not a NATO member, we're, we're always closely aligned with, with NATO and, you know, we have exchange programs with the British and Americans. So there was no doubt that we were we were an add-on to, to a NATO force, at least in the eyes of, you know, the people that were actually carrying the carrying the rifles, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I think you, you sent me quite an interesting uh, training document uh, with the Manzurian arm described in that, and um, might be sharing that in the uh, episode notes because it's a very interesting read. Yeah, they're funny. They, uh, you know, they look like Soviets, they act like Soviets, but we weren't allowed to call them Soviets. Was there a, an expectation at the time that you might be used as an expeditionary force, like in World War One and World War Two? Uh, that's pretty much all we've ever done. In, in our armed forces. So, yeah, I guess that expectation is always there. You know, like the guys, the older guys that were still serving that had served in Vietnam, you know, they, they didn't spend their time painting rocks in Australia. They they trained and then they deployed to Southeast Asia, you know, um, Vietnam, Malaya, et cetera, et cetera. So, there's, you know, you're getting your wisdom from from those guys. So, yes, yeah, we, we were never going to hang around and defend Australia. Um, until after the Cold War, then the, the focus changed on um, continental defence, I guess, for a little while. But certainly during the Cold War, yeah, it was it was expeditionary. Our mindset was expeditionary. So let's go back to you joining the uh, regular army. Can you just take me through those uh, first days and, and weeks there? Yeah, okay. Um, when you joined the regular army in Australia... Um, at the time, the reserve and the regular army, you know, we wore the same uniform and carried the same weapons, etc. But you know, they didn't really get on. the The regular army used to look look at the reservists. To, they'd call them chocos, chocolate soldiers, you know, um, in a disparaging way. Um, and so, when I signed up for the regular army, you don't get any credit for any training you've already done at the time. So I had to start from scratch. I turned up at um, uh, Melbourne at the recruiting centre there and, uh, you know, they were all very nice to you. You swear the oath again to Her Majesty the Queen, her heirs and successors. They put you on a bus and you drive for, I don't know, I think it's about six hours to 1st Recruit Training Battalion at Kapuka there in New South Wales. Then the shock starts. It's just like all the war movies. There's footprints painted on the on the pavement outside the bus and someone gets on the on the bus and starts screaming at you and you, you don't know what day it is. And I thought I was prepared to uh, for the Kapuka experience because I'd had reserve experience, but I oh know it was a it was a big shock. It was a big shock. And so you spend twelve weeks there and when I was there it was still the days of bastardization, we used to call it, you know, like um they're pretty tough. Um all the sergeants there, or many of the sergeants were were war veterans, Vietnam veterans, and um, yeah, you know, the corporals were in charge of you, your day to day life, and they were they were wanting to impress those those war veterans, I guess. Um, and so it was pretty tough, physically tough, uh, mentally tough. Did you have uh, any choice as to where you were going to end up following your basic training? Uh, that you, you do within within sort of defence requirements, I guess. So you, they, they asked you to do a list, one, two, three, four, five, six, um, of what what your core mustering. So the vast majority of the guys in my training platoon at Kapuka there, 23 platoon, um, they, they ended up in the infantry regardless of what they actually written down. It's quite competitive. So the the better you perform at Kapuka, the 
you know, the more chance you've got of getting your choice. So there was, I think there were two positions available for armour um, and I'd, I'd put armour as my number one. You know, the first reason for that was I'd, I'd already been in an armoured corps unit in the reserves and, you know, I, I kind of liked it. But the, the main reason was they, they have all these PR films that they used to show you on, on an old projector, you know, it's like hard to... Hard to fathom that we used to use projectors then but they put on a projector and and they had all these pr films showing what what the jobs were in each each corps so they had the infantry you know walking around with rifles and bayonets and machine guns etc and you know the signals core operating radios but then they put the armored core one and and on that film they, they showed these these leopard main battle tanks you know and and i thought oh my god i'd never even considered that but they were, you know, on this film, they just looked awesome. You know, like they were dark and menacing looking and the firepower was incredible. I thought, wow, maybe maybe I want that. You know, I wasn't entirely sure yet, but I knew I wanted to go to the Armoured Corps. So I put down Armoured Corps and I was lucky enough to have performed well enough that they, they freed up a slot for me. So um, on March out, I was allocated to the Royal Australian Armoured Corps. Okay, and I guess your uh, sort of reserve experience in that armoured reconnaissance regiment may have helped to some degree there, in so much that you did know how to drive a tracked vehicle. It, it's it did later. Um, you try and hide that you're a reservist. To be honest, you know, <laughs> you want to be the grey man while you're in training. Uh, you just want to look like you're performing really well, but for no <laughs> no real reason because. If they find out you're a choco, they give you some some hard treatment. So I, I just kept my head down. Of course, they had access to my records and things, but you know, some of these corporals could never have been accused of being great readers. So I just shut my mouth and head down, ass up, as they say, and and uh, just just performed. I was just a young kid, and I, you know, I could keep up on all the runs and. You know, I had the right level of aggression and, you know, I guess I could march up and down the square and shoot okay. In fact, shooting, I was I was more than okay because I was, you know, like I said, I was I was born with a rifle in my hand thanks to my, my relatives and, you know, my rural upbringing. And so how how long is the, the training course at the uh, Armoured Centre? Uh, at the Armoured Centre, it's it's around about three months. You know, like there's different modules. So there's indoctrination, uh, radio, and then DNS, driving and servicing wing. And and so there's sometimes little gaps where you're, you know, painting rocks between the, the various modules. But my course went through pretty quickly. So it went, went through, we went through in about three, four months, I guess, from, from go to woe. So... Now, I marched in in about March, and I marched out of the Armoured Centre in about late June, I think like that, something like that. Can you remember the first time you saw the leopard in the flesh? Uh, yeah, I, the leopard, the first time I saw the leopard was while I was in indoctrination, in, in the indoctrination core training wing there, at doing my in, indoctrination. So you you're sitting there in classrooms studying AFV recognition and core history and the 30 caliber machine gun, 50 caliber machine gun, etc. Most of it's classroom work in in uh, in that phase. Anyway, we got a a break. You know, like back then, everyone smoked except for me. So it's 40 minute lesson, five minute break. 40 minute lesson, five minute break. So they they fell us out. How'd you go for a five minute break? I went out for a five minute passive smoke. You know. And driving up the tank strip beside the building we were operating out of was this beautiful, menacing, dark green leopard AS1. And it rumbled and you could, you know, you could hear it. And when it, when it turned, it squeaked and rumbled at the same time. And I thought, oh my God, that is just a thing of beauty and power so that's the first time i ever saw it i'll never forget that never forget that moment and i guess there's no certainty even though you're in the armored corps that you're going to be involved with leopard no no way um again it was it was com um, competitive back then um and you know the armored corps guys 
the, the instructors all knew I was a former Choco in the CAV, you know, that I was qualified in M113. Uh, so there was no hiding that. Um, but again, when you when you put in your preferences, I I put in that I wanted to be tank driver at the at the first armoured regiment. And uh, again, I must have performed well enough that uh, I was lucky enough to get my first preference. I really thought I was going to end up in the cavalry, um, which you know, I guess what you what you know, you know; what you don't know, you don't know. So if I had have ended up in the cavalry, I would that would have been just fine, I guess. But um, I really wanted to to get behind the the sticks of a tank or the wheel of a tank, and uh, I was lucky enough to to do well enough indoctrination and radio that. I got my first choice, which was tank driver. So um, the final phase of the um, IET course, as it's called, the initial employment training course, was um, you, you move out of the all core training phases, core indoctrination and radio, into driving and servicing, where you specialise on your platform, your vehicle. So over to DNS wing, driving and servicing wing and you're in the hands of a sergeant in a crew, and that's where you start to train. And, I, yeah, so I marched over to DNS Wing and uh, started working with, with Leopard AS1 every day. Now, the, the Leopard's quite known for um, its speed. What, what was it, it like uh, to, uh, to drive? Uh, compared to the M113, it was like a Porsche sports car, mate. It it went like shit off a shovel. Um, oh, sorry, I I'm not sure if I can say that, but it, it's um, it it was quick, and and it soaked up ground that would break an M one and three and a half. So this thing, you just you just pointed it. You didn't have to throw it around across country. Um, instructors, you know, again, these old boys that had been, you know, driving tanks for or instructing tanks for years, you know, they they trained you from day one. There's two speeds on this vehicle, and that's flat out and stop. Flat out in a Leopard AS1 across country is something to behold. Yeah, it was a very agile, fast tank, quick off the mark. The suspension, you know, for a, for a, for a tank of its generation, it was unbelievably fast and agile. And so its main defence is clearly speed. Yeah, absolutely awe-inspiring to, to get behind the you know, behind the wheel in the driver's seat of, of that thing for the first time, put the accelerator to the floor and just feel the difference between M113 and and that thing was just unbelievable. Hitting ground that, you know, I, I would I would slow down because I was used to driving M113 and this instructor would say, hook in, hook in, hook in, just and, and you'd put your foot flat to the floor, and, and eventually you learn to appreciate the ground that this particular platform can can um, soak up, and it is amazing. Yeah, there was no other armoured vehicle in our inventory anyway that could could keep up with that thing. Right, because you sent me a photo of uh, a leopard sort of leaping. I guess is the is the best description. I'm I'm assuming that you do that too often. It's not going to uh, do it a lot of good but it certainly looked impressive to me yeah that that famous it, it's kind of famous in in the armored corps that photo it's called the leaping leopard photo and you know i don't know if you're going to show it on the on the episode notes or whatever but um yeah that photo is an extreme version of of what what you can do with leopard it we used to get them airborne all the time and you know that like, you could just pick your ground and and these things would soak them up. In fact, I, I, there's a bit of an urban myth. I don't know if it's true or not. Let's just say it's true for the purpose of the exercise. The um, the Germans who sold us those leopards new in 1977 saw that photo, the leaping leopard photo, and threatened to void the warranty on them because <laughs> we were using them in a completely... Australian way, let's say, you know, that we we understood that um, speed was its defence and that's how we 
that's how we operate. Well, we'll definitely be sharing that photo. Don't don't <laughs> yeah, worry, it's, Tim. Uh, it's worth it's well, worth well, a look, worth. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> It's definitely it's definitely worth a look. So, Tim, in this training, I mean, how intensive is the training? How how much how many hours do you need to have on the leopard before you're sort of cleared? Okay, so there there was about um, a week, ten days worth of what they call the details phase, where you're doing all the theory and and practice on how to dip the oil and change filters and blah blah blah, or all the all the mechanical stuff. Uh, you then you then go into these these really rudimentary simulators on how to start up and what different warning lights mean. Um, but they don't. You're not simulating any driving. All your training is done in an actual vehicle back then. And so each crewman, um, you had a, a three trainee crewman and a and an instructor commander, and um, each trainee crewman had to log eighteen hours. Um, to get his his license, and that's eighteen hours, mostly in the field, out on the Puckapunya Range, in all sorts of environments, you know, close country, um, open country, you know, by day and by night. And um, I think we had to, of our driving phase, three of them had to be on public roads. So, you know, we chuck the tanks on on civilian roads and go for a drive. Yeah. So eighteen hours in total is the long answer to a short question. That's a great answer, and I think you know while we were working on uh, preparing for 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 this, you 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 mentioned about your volunteering at the um, Army Tank Museum. That's right. Yeah, since since I've finished my service and finished my working life, I I'm now a, a volunteer at the. Tank Museum out at Puckapunyal, just you know, literally within a stone's throw of where I did my IET training all those years ago. And every so often, I I get to jump in the driver's hole of a, a Leopard AS1, just like I did when I was eighteen years old. Uh, and you for, you forget nothing. That training, yeah, you know, it's testament to the training they gave you back then. They really nailed it home. Um, you know, just through muscle memory. You got, even now, I can jump in the the hole, and I know exactly where to put my hands and feet, and I know where what different lights mean. And you know, you still have we call it tank feel, tank tank sense. It, you you can feel the vehicle and and each each individual vehicle and and what its little idiosyncrasies are. That, that training they gave you was incredible. You know, like my head is still full of ridiculous tabulated data from the nineteen eighties. Yeah, you know, like. I remember virtually everything, which is, it's crazy. You know, I, I don't remember anything from high school, but I remember all that stuff. It's 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 a waste of brain space, really, isn't it? It's incredible the amount of rubbish that that you retain. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember what my wife told me to get from the kitchen. Um, you know. Ten seconds ago, or something like that. But uh, but I, but I guess these these times are the formative times of your life. You know where you first you know under real stress. You know assessment stress, and you you're earning adult wages, and you know like I guess that's why it stays in there. But yeah, I, the, testament to the the design and delivery of that training. Um, all that time back then, it's still in there. The leopard must have seemed light years away from the Centurion, which was the previous main battle tank the Australians had. That's right. We had Centurion Mark V slash one Australian, and they were the tanks that we took to. Well, I didn't, but my predecessors took to Vietnam, and they they performed incredibly well. You know, um, they they are a much loved tank to send. Um, you know that they were quite a heavy tank compared to Leopard. Uh, you know, slow. Um, but they hit hard. They're probably the best tank deployed to Vietnam, but as a result of their service in Vietnam, most of those tanks, by the time they went out of service in 77, we bought them in 55, 1955, and they soldiered on until 1977. So they were really tired by the time they went out of service. And there's all these stories, you know, the old fellas used to tell me about, you know, some of them wouldn't even make, them, make it to the end of the tank strip. To go on an exercise, they were, they were quite unreliable by the time they went out of service, um, and so the leopard was was quite welcome when it, you know, like I said, it was like a sports car compared to the Centurion. 
One of my listeners, James Toms, looks after, or he's a driver for a uh, museum, Centurion, um, and he's often uh, posting uh, videos of him uh, mm. moving moving it around the yard and you know taking it out on various um, exhibits. And it's um, well, it's not necessarily a forgotten tank, but it probably doesn't get as much spotlight as it deserves because I mean it served very well in Korea as well. Yeah, that's right. You know, like. In Vietnam, you know, like it, it was, it saved lives. You know, it saved infantry lives and it saved um, the lives of its crew. You know, there's some of those centurions took multiple RPG hits, you know, and, um, you know, most, I, I'm not sure if we lost, lost a crewman to a penetration from an RPG in, in, um, in Vietnam, but, Certainly, we got a few wounded, but mostly it's because of um, the way we operated them, which was for situational awareness. The, the commanders and they, they have their heads out. Even now, we we operate a bit like that, so a bit like the Israelis do, with the commanders with their heads out, and so you're you're more prone to 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 be hit by a fragmentation or small arms fire that way, I guess. But um, the the Centurion. I guess like Leopard, it, it had so many different natures of ammunition that it could bring to a fight, and and its number one killer in Vietnam was um, canister. You know, it had, it had that giant shotgun shell. So they would, you know, at the Battle of Coral Balmoral and Bin Bar, they would use canister to this devastating effect. You know, they would thump it over the top of a bunker, reveal a bunker, and then hit it with um, the armour-piercing round, the cap ballistic cap round, the big heavy metal slug break the bunker open and then open it you know and then just smash it up with um he at at zero range you know like literally zero range from you know a few feet from the end of the muzzle it must have been terrifying to have those centurions coming at you in vietnam yeah absolutely absolutely so you graduate Graduate the correct word, pass out. Yeah, march out. We, we used to call it march out, pass out. March yep. out, march out. Mm. Okay, okay. And you earn the black beret. That's right. Yeah, the um, you know uh, when I when I marched in as a trainee at the armoured centre, it was uh, yeah they put these blue berets on you. You know you wore, wore the core badge and this this blue beret. You know these issue blue berets too you know like they they must be made in the 60s and they're the size of a pizza dish on your head and you just felt like a trainee we called them pogues like all the other the non non arms corps wore you know the cooks and the bottle washers all wore these dark blue and we so we were lumped in with them as trainees and we 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 just couldn't wait to earn our black beret and you know um so on march out you you know, you're handed your tank license and your black beret, and you're able to put that on, and you feel pretty good. You know, you're uh, you're wearing your regimental badge of your new regiment on your on your black beret, and so um, so some of us um, we decided to throw our blue berets under the tracks of a leopard and and do a pivot turn on it, turning it into a you know a woolly mound of dust, and uh, that felt very good. That that was a great feeling. So yep, from that on, from that time on, we're you know, we're qualified tank crewmen and you know, walking, walking tall and feeling ten foot tall. So that was a that was a great feeling marching out of the armament centre as a as a qualified tank driver. So what what is the uh, unit that you're uh, posted to? Yep, I was posted to um, First Armoured Regiment, um, which is just over the hill from the armament centre in in the same garrison, Pakapunyal. Uh, so I went to A Squadron. Three Troop A Squadron in the First Armoured Regiment um, as as the Troop Sergeant's driver. So that was uh, it was all a bit new and scary because you, you know, you're no longer training, you're employed, and um, you're, you're you're definitely the the newbie as they they called you. And uh, there's all these you know old soldiers around you that you know. They know everything. They know all the lurks and the perks, and the, and you just try and keep your mouth shut and stay out of trouble for a while because they were they were proper warriors. Those guys. It, there wasn't a great deal of turnover in the regiment at the time, so some of those 
tank crewmen had been around for a long time, you know, or seemingly a long time. And so, you know, you'd, even the even the diggers, even the, the other troopers, you, you respected them because they had that earned knowledge. So, yeah, you very much felt like the new guy when you marched in. And this was June 88. That's right, yeah. Ju- yeah, about June June 88 I, I marched in um, to the regiment and, yeah, the pace the pace of uh, work was was pretty pretty high at the time. Um, the the regiment was undermanned. You know, we had some people away on um, on uh, on a, another task, and the regiment was um, preparing to go on a, a massive exercise over to the old Woomera rocket range, um, nuclear testing, uh, rocket testing, and nuclear testing sites over in South Australia in the outback. And so the tanks were being prepared to uh, to go over there, and um, so you know there was a lot of driver training, a lot of gunnery training, um, all going on all at once, and the, and stowing of tanks and double stowing and double checking, you know. So that was that was pretty big. Um, and it wasn't long after I marched in that I actually deployed on this exercise, where you know you could literally drive your tank for days. Um, in a in a training area that you know was as big as some European countries, incredible. Yeah, it was a real learning curve for me. I think you, you'd mentioned to me that that it was as large as Belgium. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> huge. But uh, well, we'll come on to it later on. But you described there was one the size of Western Europe that you ended up on some range. Yeah, we'll it, come on to that later. Yeah. We'll, we'll keep that one. Yeah, right. Okay. So I mean, a a, a training area that that size i mean w- what are you doing each day are you advancing you know you, are you how far are you traveling each day yeah i remember that first exercise it was uh, an exercise called dry partis i don't know why that's retained in my mind but it was called dry partis and um it put us through all the phases of war so it was you know advance attack you know defend um delay you know um all those uh, um advanced to contact, you know, encounter type battles. And and it was all pretty much all live firing. So, you know, you were carrying, you were fully bombed up the whole time, you know, um, green flag flying, red flag flying, which means, you know, um, you're in a live firing environment. You know, some of those moves, you would drive all day and all night. You you were dog tired and then you would, you would go into a dawn attack or whatever, like, and, and live firing. It, It was, it was unbelievable. And as a as a young tank driver, you know, with only eighteen hours experience, you're in this environment that we've never operated in. Puckapunyal is a completely different environment to Woomera, and I believe, I sincerely believe that I hit every hole in the Woomera range area. I I, I was yelled at from pillar to post, and. <laughs> Yeah, given a few slaps around the back of the head, um, and I, I thought, oh my god, I'm never going to make a tank driver on that exercise. I thought, I just can't read the ground anymore, you know. And we, we have to go fast, but I, I, there was just something about that ground that I, I didn't perform well, um, and I was pretty hard on myself, and I, I swore I would do better. But you know, great, it's just you know, you you do get better, and and the way we operated those leopards was. Like I say, there was no simulators. We we did we all our training was 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 live. So I, I think by the time the Cold War ended, I would have had thousands of hours driving a leopard. You know, I could drive it in my sleep, and often did. Essentially, you're living on that tank then for days, or is it weeks? Um, it, it weeks. Yeah, you're just living out of living living out of your your pack in the little armoured bin there, and um. Sleeping on the back deck. My tank was was call sign one three alpha. Um, uh, Astra Wally was its name. Not that we ever called them by their name, but um, we just called them by their call sign. But they all had a name painted on the side. And um, yeah, just living. You know, you you you're sleeping on them. The on the three on the three million dollar electric blanket we used to call the engine deck. You know, um, and and eating. Eating from them, you know, just yeah, every day. That's your home. It's like your mobile home. Mm. And and could they stand that sort of wear and tear? Because you 
you know, I always think of sort of like major movements of tanks are generally by rail or by road transporter, whereas you're actually driving these things, well, hundreds of kilometers a day by the sound of it. And going down every hole in Woomera. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, I, I had to. Ch- I learned how to change shock absorbers. Put it that way. Yeah, in Woomera. Um, yeah, like on, on that exercise, that would have been. They would have clocked up hundreds of kilometres per vehicle, hundreds. And um, that's the beauty. The Leopard could take it. It could take it. It was a beautiful tank. You know, it soaked. Like I say, it soaked up the terrain. Yeah, yeah. As long as you kept the pads and the road wheels up to it, you know, the track pads and the and the road wheels, you know, they would shed a bit, um, you know, and paid paid attention to your maintenance. Those tanks, they would take it. Yeah, the the Leopard One was was magnificent for for our environment. Absolutely magnificent. You you mentioned earlier that the sort of the unit was full of real warriors. Can you tell me about your first commander? Yep, my first commander was was actually a British soldier. Um, his name was Chris Mander. I think he went he went on to become the RSM of one of the Royal Tank Regiments. Um, but he was over on exchange. We have this active exchange program um, between the British and the Australians, and you know more recently the the Americans. And um, so Chris was, you know, I kind of idolised him as well because he he wore a funny uniform. He had this black tank suit and spoke with a funny accent. Um, but I, I think Chris was probably on a learning curve as well at the time. He, you know, like I say, we operate tanks in a very different way to the to the old chieftains that he would have been used to. Um, in navigation, our guys could navigate, our commanders could navigate, and I think Chris probably struggled with his navigation at that time. Um, you know, because they're so fast and the terrain's so variable in Australia, as a as a tank commander, you have to be right on point with your land navigation. This is in the days before GPS and all that sort of stuff. And I, I remember at Woomera that each tank pulled out an old sun compass, like the you know they would have fought in North Africa in the Second World War. They had a sun compass with a little needle. You know, um, um, Chris was a great first commander. He looked after me, um, and after Chris, I I got he he went on some leave after that exercise. And I, I got this Australian um, tank commander, a corporal, and, and he took me under his wing as well. And, you know, he's still one of my friends today. He's, he's an amazing guy. He, he went on right through as core RSM, et cetera. I was going to ask how, how you did navigate because I, I've never been to Australia, but I can imagine there are some geographical features you can navigate by, but in some areas there's perhaps not that many. Yeah, well, that's the beauty of it. It makes you a better, better crewman, better commander. I, I think um, the types of terrain that we operated in throughout the Cold War and later, yeah, you know, we, we we're operating them. Those leopards up in Shoalwater Bay in the really close tropical Queensland country, um, you know, to places like Woomera, and later on across the top of Australia, right across the the top end of Australia in the you know the terrain that varies from tropical to arid. Yeah. You know, and so as a commander, you just got really good at map to ground navigation. In fact, I, I remember I was a, a young trooper still during the Cold War and, and I'd been selected to be a bit of an experiment. Me and another guy we, were, we we'd performed pretty well as tank crewmen and they said, let's try these two young guys out and put them on the commander's course. So I, I was I was actually a trooper tank commander. And um Navigation was the thing that was going to make or break us, and I, I, I remember just scraping through by the skin of my teeth on land navigation because those instructors, my God, by day or by night, they could just sort of sense where they were. I, you know, we that's one thing. I'm in awe of some of those early guys that trained me. You know, they 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 just. They were magnificent navigators and controlling their crews while they're while they're reading a map by red light in the dark. Just incredible. Did you have any NBC training? We were uh, we were trained in in all the NBC stuff. We had the uh, a modified British NBC suit. You know the you know the dark green 
charcoal lined NBC suit, and we used um, the American M17A1 respirator, which was a pile of junk. I hated that thing. You know, you couldn't change the filters without taking the mask off. So I don't know what we were ever supposed to do once those filters were full of agent. But anyway, that's... That seems like a major design fault. That. Yeah, they're, they're the same masks that the Americans took to the first Gulf War. I, I think if, 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 the, if, if the Cold War had gone hot, the Americans in an NBC environment, the Americans would have been in real strife with those masks. They were a, they were a pile of junk. And, and I, I seem to remember they had a, like a breathing ratio of four to one or something, so it was four times harder than normal to breathe through them. And when, when they eventually got replaced by the, the magnificent British S10 gas masks or respirators, um, oh, my God, you could actually breathe and... You know, you could actually see they had the British ones were leaps and bounds ahead of those American masks. But yeah, for the first part of my career, we had those those rubbish M seventeen A one masks. And um, yeah, so we, you know, they made us. You know, we had sort of NBC week in the regiment, so you'd be servicing your tank in NBC environment, and you know, learning how to drink and learning how to detect, um, learning how to go to the toilet in an NBC environment, all that sort of crap. Um, so, yeah, yeah. But Leopard, Leopard had an overpressure system. Um, so in theory, you didn't even need to mask up while you're in the tank, but our practice was always, you know, full personal NBC equipment plus the vehicle NBC protection system. But we hated it. We hated the NBC training. It was just like like all the tank soldiers that I've heard, they hated it, you know. Um, I remember one exercise, you know, we're out for a few days in this NBC environment and you're looking through the periscopes and all the kangaroos are hopping by and they're fine. <laughs> you know, there's no NBC. And the troop leader would say, you know, I can see kangaroos outside. They're doing fine. Can we, can we uh, open up? And the answer over the radio was, courses, no, suck it up. And sounds like NBC Week was always a very popular uh, Oh, it was horrible because you'd, you'd do PT, you know, you'd do physical training in in NBC and, you know, guys are, you can barely breathe. It's like breathing through a drinking straw while you're running. If it, try that. You, that's That'll give you some simulation of it. It's just horrible, yeah. Did the um, leopard have river fording capabilities did it have a snorkel or anything like that just just with its own its own um short snorkel it, it could go 2.25 meters so uh, up to the turret roof or over the turret roof and then it there was an, a big a big snorkel you could put on where you could drive literally under the water four meters four meters in depth and and it was unlike a lot of tanks it was it was pretty easy to prepare it you know you had a little bicycle pump inside that had seal the um the turret ring and this other pump which would close all the the various flaps for the engine and 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 all that sort of stuff and and away you go we we regularly forded forded creeks you know in the tropical north particularly just just by making sure that our our uh, fording capability was up to scratch you could go through through creeks that other vehicles would have to turn away from yeah leopard was good Good as far as fording, yeah. I can't imagine being reliant on a bicycle pump to uh, ensure your 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 tank is waterproof. You imagine uh, the little gap between the the turret and the hull has it had a they called it the turret ring seal. So it was literally a like a rubber bike tube that you you know you had this little cranky pump thing and. I forget what the the barometric pressure you had to make sure it was up to before you were waterproof, but yeah, you did, and and it works. That's you know it's German design, beautiful. And what what was it like driving a tank underwater? As as a driver, the, I remember the first time it, it was uh, you know you you you're out in the in the daylight, you you're viewing the world through your periscopes, and then you know you hear driver advance and. And down you go down down the ramp through a fording pool. We had a fording pool um, or a, a lake, a, our local lake, Lockley, and um, 
your, your vision would go, all of a sudden you'd see the water coming and then it would go sort of light tan and then it would go dark brown and then black, completely black, and then water pissing in through the through the hatch seal, you know, because they're waterproof but they're not that waterproof. And so, you know, you, you would be, uh, you know, like a bad submarine movie from, you know, this dust boot, you know, where the water's, you know, yeah. pouring in through the hatches. It, it's just like that. And so, you know, you've got little bilge pumps inside and they're, they're pumping out any water that, that gets in. But, you know, very capable, very capable. And, and you, could, you could actually just sit in there as long as the engine was running. You, you know, they would burble away and, you know, and, and – Gave you real confidence in that wagon. It was a it was a great tank for that sort of thing. I I interviewed a T seventy two tank commander for, with the East Germans, and and he didn't like doing the uh, the snorkel practice. I think it was a bit more of bit more effort um, to uh, set up. Whereas it sounds like the the leopard had it to quite a fine art in terms of how quickly it could be configured. Yeah, absolutely, and and I, I've actually seen a, an old DDR training film on preparing the T seventy two. You know, and you know they couldn't escape through their snorkel. Our snorkel was, you know, just an extension of the commander's hatch. So, you know, your crew could get out. Whereas I think in a T seventy two, if 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 it failed, oh my god, you you you're trapped underwater. That would just been horrific. Yeah, I wouldn't have liked to have gone underwater in a, a Soviet tank. Coming back to the the Soviets, I mean, nineteen eighty nine comes round. Um, can can you remember where where you were when you heard that the Berlin Wall had opened? You know, I think I was in the field. I, I because I think I'm, I'm I think it. I heard it on a, on the radio, like on the BBC World Service or the ABC or something like that. You know, just tuned in low, and and someone said, "Shit, the Berlin Wall's come down," and and I, and I, you know, and then I thought, "Yeah, but I'm tired, and I've got to go on picket soon." And that was that was that was my Berlin Wall experience. Yeah, I I, I seem to remember I was I was in the field, but I, and something leaps out at me that I was in Northern Australia at the time. You know, like surrounded by mosquitoes, and you know termite mounds so yeah it was a, a bit of a, a bit of a contrast to, <laughs> to being in berlin with the wall coming down but yeah when you had some time to contemplate it did you think oh th- this is really going to change things as far as my role <laughs> yes and no um you know of course the soviets were on our mind you know in the back of our mind um you know, particularly with the exchange programs we had with British, you know, because we, we we were pretty kept up to date with the inner German border and the Third Shock Army and, you know, all that sort of thing. But, you know, there was also that focus of um, war up in the archipelago to our north and, and fighting in jungles like our fathers and grandfathers would have, you know, like we, we were still focused on, Regional defence as well, I guess, and and when the I, I do remember when the um, when the wall came down, our our training enemy changed as well. They they really uh, focused not so much on fighting Soviet style motor rifle divisions, but more insurgents, and so they changed they changed from the Missourians at the time to this other mythical enemy called the Khmerians, which were much poorer than the Missourians and much. Not not as well equipped, you know. They had AK forty sevens and you know rented Toyota Land Cruisers and things like that. So yeah. we'd the, we'd gone back to yeah fan. yeah yeah. So so I guess we were lucky, you know, at the time because you know some of the guys who stayed in um, after after I went, you know, they ended up in actually fighting insurgents in Iraq and Afghanistan and things like that. You know, so. That change in focus probably did us no harm. We, we were, we were. There was always that mindset that if you're trained to fight conventionally, you can switch to to asymmetric warfare quite easily. Um, but if you just train 
for insurgencies or asymmetric warfare, the training leap to conventional war is is too big. Um, so we were lucky. We we had a we had both. And I believe that in eighty nine there was a big exercise, Kangaroo eighty nine, really original with with the names of your exercises in Australia. Oh yeah, yeah, right? they, yeah. They 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 put a lot of thought into that. Yeah. Part two will be in a few weeks' time, where we hear about Tim's experiences on Kangaroo eighty nine and his meeting with an East German tank commander. Don't miss the episode extras such as videos, photos and other content. Just look for the link in the podcast information. The podcast wouldn't exist without the generous support of our financial supporters and I'd like to thank one and all of them for keeping the podcast on the road. The Cold War Conversation continues in our Facebook discussion group. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thanks very much for listening and see you next week.